From the victory that God gave Israel, the nation of Israel descended into a destructive tribalism, further dividing the people of Israel. And recall the words of Jesus that a house divided against itself cannot stand. The victory over their common enemy ended up becoming the downfall of Jephthah and his entire generation because of a false pride, a jealousy, and a self-importance. And this great leader, Jephthah, ended his career as a Gileadite, not as an Israelite, and not as a uniter of Israel as one nation under God. Despite defeating the Ammonites, the nation of Israel knew no peace and had no rest. Whether it's between a husband and wife or children and parents, whether it's employees in an office, people in a nation, or people in a church congregation, division always brings destruction. And leadership matters. The failures of Jephthah just like every other deliverer in the book of Judges, reveals this downward spiral of Israel that goes deeper and deeper in every chapter into sin. And in a spiritual sense, you and I are left to ask like the apostle Paul did at the end of chapter 7 of the book of Romans. He ends that section by a desperate question. Who will deliver me from this body of sin? And Israel could be asking, who will deliver us as a nation from our own sin? And the answer to the failed judges is the same as the answer to you and me about our sin, Jesus Christ. So let's turn in the word of God this morning to Judges chapter number 12. We're going to talk about major lessons from minor judges. I'll start reading in verse number seven and read through the end of this chapter. Follow along with me. Jephthah judged Israel six years. Then Jephthah the Gileadite died and was buried in among the cities of Gilead. After him, Ibzam of Bethlehem judged Israel. He had 30 sons and he gave away 30 daughters in marriage and brought in 30 daughters from elsewhere for his sons. He judged Israel seven years. Then Ibzan died and was buried at Bethlehem. Verse 11. After him, Elon the Zebulonite judged Israel. He judged Israel 10 years. And Elon the Zebulonite died and was buried at Ajalon in the country of Zebulun. Verse 13. After him, Abdon, the son of Hillel, the Pirithonite, judged Israel. He had 40 sons and 30 grandsons who rode on 70 young donkeys. He judged Israel eight years. Then Abdon, the son of Hillel, the Pirithonite, died and was buried in Pirithon in the land of Ephraim in the mountains of the Amalekites. No rest, no peace. Following the judgeship of Jephthah, we don't have that usual statement that Israel had peace or rest. But we also don't have any statement that Israel fell into sin or that God turned the people over to an enemy. Instead, what the writer to the book of Judges does is he gives us three minor judges. They're minor in the sense only that God gives us very little details about them or the terms of their leadership. The history of their ministry shows there was political stability. There was also some degree of economic prosperity, but it also shows that there was a decline in the spiritual state of the nation. And these men kind of serve as that quiet interlude, that little bit of take your breath, reflect on everything that we've already read, and prepare yourself for something else that's going to be more shocking even yet. So we're going to take the first of these minor judges as well as the third together. Ibzan had 30 sons and 30 daughters. Abdon had 40 sons and 30 grandsons. 
And those numbers tell us a lot, actually. They tell us that there was some degree of material prosperity, at least for the judges. That doesn't mean that just because the judges had a lot of mouths to feed and could do it, that everybody else did. You know as well as I do that there is a group of people in the United States who make the rules, who make the laws, who live very differently than you and I do. We can assume safely that that is true as well as we're looking at these three men. It's very expensive to feed and to clothe and to care for multiple wives so that they could give birth to that many children. And that kind of multiplication, though, was the way that royalty in the Middle East often lived. And it shows us that really the judges of Israel were taking on more and more of the culture of the people surrounding them. If the world around us is doing it, then we might as well do it too. Israel was divided by all this tribalism. And this is going to happen for a short time until we get the strong leadership of God's man by the name of David. These men were known not because of their good politics, not because they united people. They were known because they had lots of children. The man that's sandwiched in between Elon, he's like Ibzan and Abdon. What did Elon do that's noteworthy? Nothing. He was the judge, but he did nothing of note. There's no deliverance. There's no rest. There's no following after God. There's no repentance from sin. There's nothing. And what we get from these judges is really the same thing. Each man was born. Each man lived. Each man died. And if the only thing of significance is he had 30 kids, that tells you he didn't really do much. What kind of a story is that for a deliverer? He was born, he had 30 children, and then he died. So why did God even include these guys in the story of the judges? Why did he include them in the Bible if that's all that they did? Let me give seven reasons that I think God included these three men in the story for us. First off, to insist that this book of Judges is historically true. It's historically accurate. This is not a made-up tale. Let's go back for a second and talk about that first and that third judge. Ibzan and Abdon, they were busy having kids. But it also gives us something of a look into Jewish and Middle Eastern custom and values of the time. Ibzan was busy using his family for his own gain. Look at him again in verse number 9 at what he does. He had 30 sons. He also had 30 daughters that he gave away in marriage. And in the process, he brought in 30 daughters from elsewhere for his sons. That means he was treating his daughters like property. For what purpose? It says he brought in these other women from outside, from elsewhere. Something to be sold, something to be traded, something to be used for his own personal gain. And that's how women are described in the book of Judges. Look ahead to chapter 14, verse number 2. I want to show you how women are portrayed in Jewish society during the time of the Judges. Chapter 14, verse number 2. So Samson went up and told his father and mother, saying, I've seen a woman in Timnah of the daughters of the Philistines. Therefore, go get her for me as a wife. Verse number 15. It came to pass on the seventh day that they said to Samson's wife, Entice your husband that he may explain the riddle to us, or else we will burn you and your father's house with fire. Talk about respect for women. Have you invited us in order to take what is ours? Is that not so? And Samson's wife wept on him and said, You only hate me. You do not love me. You've posed a riddle to the sons of my people, but you've not explained it to me. And he said to her, Look, I have not explained it even to my father or my mother. So should I explain it to you? See, she's being used as a pawn, and even Samson doesn't respect her. He says, Why would I tell you? I never told anybody else this stuff. No respect for his own wife. 
chapter 14, verse number 20. Samson's wife was given to his companion, who was his best man. She's just a piece of property to be traded. Chapter number 16. Now Samson went to Gaza and he saw a harlot there and he went into her. Here's another woman. She's just a woman to be used by men. In chapter number 16 about Delilah, Delilah was used exactly the same way Samson's first wife was used. She's threatened with death for her and her family if she doesn't do what they want her to do. Chapter number 19 of Judges is the story of a Levite who gets home to find that his wife had been a harlot. Men could have two different kinds of wives. You could have the wife that you were going to have children and heirs with, but you also had a mistress that you were married to called the concubine. And her only purpose was for sexual gratification. And this Levite, whose job was to take care of the things of God, finds that his concubine had played the harlot. The story, if you keep reading, turns in treachery and murder. When we get to chapter 20, it's the very same thing. Women are again treated as property. We will find wives who are murdered and hacked up into little pieces. Chapter 21 very same thing. Women at the time of the judges treated worse than animals. Ibsen married his daughters to other leaders so that he could create or cement influence and stability with leaders of other places. Men are less likely to fight each other if they share the same grandchildren. And that's what was taking place in Israel. Abdon's sons and his grandsons, they were all riding on donkeys. Donkeys were symbols of wealth and of influence. And between these two guys, they had more than 100 children and grandchildren. And yet remember our previous judge, Jephthah? He had no sons and he sacrificed his only daughter. One of the things that we see in the book of Judges is the disintegration, not only of the unity of Israel, but the breakdown of the family trading your children for political gain. And there could be a lot said about what's going on in the United States with the treatment of women. When we get further into the story of Samson, we're going to talk about prostitution and pornography in the United States. So first of all, the book is historically true. It gives us an accurate picture of not only these three judges, but what society was like in Israel. And there is a very strong move today to discount the historicity, the accuracy of the Bible. You would be surprised at how many Christian leaders are coming out and publicly saying, we don't believe that the beginning of the Bible is real. What they do is they spiritualize or they allegorize the scripture, and it's nothing new. It began actually in the second century of Christianity, but what is new today is how fast that idea is spreading. That's how a pastor can stand up in a pulpit and say, the Bible doesn't criticize homosexuality because they don't take the statements like about Sodom and Gomorrah literally. But think with me, the first 11 chapters of Genesis that are under such extreme attack today, those chapters establish some important truths. One, the eternality of the Godhead. In the beginning, God created. God was not made by mankind, but mankind was made by God. God existed before the creation. There's a literal six-day creation of the universe. The centrality of God's creation of man. What is the most important aspect of God's creation in the universe? It's not the trees, and it's not the ocean. It's mankind. But you see, if you believe that those first 11 chapters are not literal, they're not history, they're not real, then what takes the place of man? Nature. Because man is not the focus anymore. Creation. Nature is. In fact, some of these green people have even said the pandemic was a good thing because it killed off so many people. We have in the first chapter of Genesis the introduction of Satan. If Satan isn't real, then what is it that we are struggling and fighting against? Because sin is also introduced in those first chapters. 
the nature and reality of sin and how sin has spread to all of mankind. We've got God's promise of eternal life. We have the nature and the need for redemption in those first chapters. We've got the promise of a redeemer. We have the story of gender, male and female, in those chapters. If you don't believe the beginning of Genesis is history, that it is real, then there is no need for there to be male and female. There can be all kinds of genders. Marriage and family begin in those first chapters of the book of Genesis, as well as nations. If that's not real, if that's not history, if it's not accurate, if they're just made up stories to teach us some truth, where does that lead us? If those chapters didn't happen literally, just like they're recorded in there, then why should we think anything else in the Bible is real or literal or accurate or trustworthy? If God begins the Bible with stories that are made up, who's to say that the story of David isn't made up? Or the stories of Jesus? Or the stories of heaven and hell? Why should we trust anything in the Bible if we can't begin by trusting the Bible? If the Bible begins with myths, how can you tell me that the rest of the Bible isn't a myth? And let me say this without equivocation at all. If your pastor doesn't believe in the literalness and the historicity of the first 11 chapters of the book of Genesis, you need to leave that pastor. You need to leave that church. You need to get out of there. You need to find a congregation that believes that the Bible is true from beginning to end. First reason these three guys are there is to prove to us this is history. This is accurate. This is exactly what was going on. Second, to take note of the, these three minor judges is that they remind us that you can have a lot of people in charge, whether it's a home or it's a business or it's government or it's the local church. But really, there are very few leaders among those who are in charge. And there are even fewer who are able to save or to deliver those people that they lead. You'll be very hard pressed today to find a political figure who doesn't promise what he cannot produce. Promises are easy. Talk is cheap. Faith without works is dead. And those who want to be in charge, even in the local church, are many. But true leaders are a rare <laughs> gift that God gives. Most Christians are familiar with the list of spiritual gifts that we find in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. A lot of Christians are totally unaware that there are other lists of spiritual gifts in the New Testament. Romans chapter 12 gives a list of spiritual gifts that is different than in 1 Corinthians. 1 Peter chapter 4 gives a list of spiritual gifts that is different than in 1 Corinthians. And yet, for some reason, Everybody wants to focus on 1 Corinthians and ignore Romans and 1 Peter. Those three lists together, though, give us some of the gifts of the Holy Spirit by which he works in believers in the assembly of believers. Remember what a spiritual gift is. God the Holy Spirit doing something and using you to do it. And God gives spiritual gifts to believers to be used in the assembly of believers to encourage one another, to build one another up in our faith. One person may have a gift for giving. I am thankful that God has given some people gifts of giving. I'm thankful that God has given some people a gift of singing, because you don't want to hear me sing all the time. I'm grateful that God has given us people with a gift of teaching who can take and explain the word of God word by word, verse by verse, chapter by chapter, book by book, idea upon idea. I'm grateful that God has brought those gifts into the church. In Ephesians chapter 4, though, we have another important list. So three lists of spiritual gifts. But in Ephesians chapter 4, the Apostle Paul gives us a list of four offices in the church. Four groups of leaders to the church for the growth, the edification, the building up of the church. Apostles and prophets and evangelists and pastor teachers. 
And in the Greek, those last two, pastor and teacher, are connected. They are one office, meaning that the pastor must also be a Bible teacher. Earlier in the book of Ephesians, Paul also mentions twice that God gave the apostles and prophets to write the scriptures. Church, if the scriptures are written and they are complete, there is no need for apostles and prophets today. So where is the emphasis then? It's on evangelism by evangelists and the pastor teachers. But you know, there are a lot of evangelists out there who are not preaching the gospel according to the scripture. And the world is overfilled with pastors, but very few pastor teachers meet the qualifications of the scriptures. And they are very lacking in accurately and faithfully teaching the whole counsel of God's word. One of the benefits of having a preacher who preaches verse by verse is that I have to deal with every issue raised in scripture. Do you know how many pastors never will talk about certain things? Because they don't want to get into the controversy. It's too difficult for them to figure out, let alone explain to anybody else. We've gone through more than half of the Bible since I've been a pastor here in Portland in this congregation. And we have had to deal with every issue you can imagine. I can't escape anything as we go verse by verse. And let me say it bluntly, the local church has an awful lot of busybodies, but it has very few leaders. The third reason God put these three nobodies in the middle of our book of Judges is to make clear that God did not give Israel rest. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 24 that in the days when Noah was building the ark, humanity was busy. They were busy with life, but there was also no spiritual rest in that world at rebellion against God. Life in the days of Ibzan and Elon and Abdon appear to have continued just like they did before. Nothing was different. Everybody was busy doing their thing. Everybody was busy living, but it was all living without God. There was busyness without divine blessing. Have you ever sat by the side of the road and watched all the people going places and then asked yourself, where are they all going? Uh, the first week of August, I took my wife to the airport early in the morning. I couldn't believe how early in the morning the roads were so busy. People driving at a time when everybody should be sleeping. Busy, busy, busy. But most of them are not busy about the father's business. A fourth reason I believe God includes the story of these three minor judges is to show us that God doesn't give us the details about everything. There are things that God has chosen to keep to himself. Turn back in your Bible to the book of Deuteronomy, chapter number 29, and look at verse 29. The secret things belong to the Lord our God. But those things which are revealed belong to us and to our children forever, so that we may do all the words of this law. God has secret things he hasn't told us. The second part is the things that God has told us. Those are the things we're supposed to focus on. How many of us spend a lot of our time on the things God has never said anything about? We want to know why this and why that when God hasn't told us. Those things that inquiring minds want to know. There are things God keeps away from us, but he does give us significant and sufficient information so that we can obey him. He reveals himself. He tells us all that we need to know about being saved. But he also tells us everything that we need to know to live godly lives. How many angels can dance on the head of a pin? Can God make a rock so big he can't throw it? And literally for hundreds of years, Roman Catholic monks sat in castles in Europe, majoring on the minors and minoring on the things that are of most importance. While we think we want to know every little detail about every little thing that's of interest to me or to you, I honestly believe that there's a lot of things it's better not to know the day that you would die and the manner in which you would die, would you want to know? My wife's dad died from a severe burn. He lingered six weeks in a burn ward over most of his body. Do you think he would have wanted to know that as a child? The day 
the time, the manner, and the suffering that he would go through, but the suffering also of his wife and his children. Because during that six weeks, his youngest child didn't get to even see him. She was farmed off to families she didn't even know in some cases. Even worse, would you want to know the gruesome details of how your children or your grandchildren would die? We need to remember that God does tell us the things that we need to know. He tells us what we need to know so that we can be saved, so we can live lives that honor him. And those are the things we need to pay attention to. Those are the things we need to obey. The book of Judges is often preached and taught with the judges being the focus. But these men, how often I've heard that they are heroes. They become the focus. But the real hero of the Bible is God, not his servants. Judges reminds us of this. There's a fifth reason the judges are included in the Bible, and that's to teach us to number our days. Psalm chapter 90, verse number 12, David said, Lord, teach us to number our days, because death is man's constant. Each of those judges that God raised up to deliver his people died. Each and every one of them was mortally flawed. And the Bible reveals them for exactly who and what they all were. And the Bible, if we read it, reveals us exactly as we are. Sinful creatures, redeemed, however, through the death of Jesus. We see their sins. We see their weaknesses. And through them, we can see our own. As we've looked at some of these men who were judges, I hope you've seen through a mirror your own self. We also have God's revealed eternal judge to us, Jesus. Jesus, who knew no sin. And though he died to pay for our sins, death can never touch him again. In Jesus' death and in his resurrection, he broke sin's power and he removed its sting from God's own people. These three judges were born. They lived lives that made no eternal consequence. They did nothing for any of God's people. And then they died. And it points us heavenward to the one who did everything for his people. The sixth reason I can think to include the brief mention of these minor judges is distress that most of us will only ever be like them. You and I spend a lifetime working to build an empire. And yet, at the end of your days, your epitaph will be little more than you were born. You lived a certain amount of time, and then you died. That's what the world will know and remember of you, just like these three. What's important is not the things you leave behind for your family. What's important isn't that you make your mark in the world. What's important is not that others even remember you. How often have we gone to a cemetery and looked at all the headstones? Every one of them is exactly like these three judges. They were born, they obviously lived, and then they died. We know nothing other than that about them. And that's where each of us is going. What's really important is knowing that the God who called you to himself is the God who remembers you. God remembered these three men. To him, they were important enough to at least put their names in there. And God remembers you. It's not about the people who remember us. The question is, does God remember you? John Newton, the great English preacher and hymn writer and former slave trader, toward the end of his life, he said these words, although my memory is fading, I remember two things very clearly. I am a sinner and Christ is a great savior. How wonderful it is to know that God remembers me. Amen. We are going to forget and we will all be forgotten except by the unforgettable and the unforgetting God. I remember sitting month after month with a woman in the hospital with Alzheimer's who didn't even know her own name. And I'd walk into the room and she didn't know anybody or anything, but she always smiled when she saw me. And I said, Jackie, do you know who I am? She says, I don't know your name, but you're the guy that always makes me smile. 
Um, I would lay down in the hospital bed with her, and we'd just talk about whatever she wanted to talk about. And we'd lay there in the bed together, and she would always sing, Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. Little ones to him belong. They are weak, but he is strong. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. The Bible tells me so. A woman who didn't even know her own name remembered that Jesus loved her. And at the end of our days, that's something we need to know. But even if we forget that, God doesn't forget his own. But even if we forget that word, God doesn't forget his own. How wonderful that is. That while I can still remember that, I remember God doesn't forget me. The unforgettable and unforgetting God. The secret things belong to God. Finally, the minor judges elevate that mystery of God's will and the way that God works. Children are a gift from God. Children are a display of God's grace. But why are some marriages barren of any offspring? Why do some men and some women, despite being wonderful people, even go unmarried? Why are some people rich and other people struggle to lift their heads even above poverty level? Some people live short lives despite doing everything right. And other people who seem to do everything medically and socially wrong end up living long lives. Why is that? Turn to the book of Acts chapter 12. I'll start with verse number one. Now about that time, Herod the king stretched out his hand to harass some from the church. Then he killed James, the brother of John, with the sword. The church has just begun, and Herod kills James. Why? Look now at verse number six. When Herod was about to bring him out that night, bring who? Peter. He kills James, and he throws Peter in jail. Herod was about to bring Peter out. That night, Peter was sleeping bound with two chains between two soldiers, and the guards before the door were keeping the prison. And behold, an angel of the Lord stood by him, and a light shone in the prison, and he struck Peter on the side and raised him up, saying, Get up quickly! And his chains fell off his hands. And then the angel said to him, Gird yourself, tie on your sandals. And so he did. And he said to Peter, put on your garment, follow me. So he went out and followed him and did not know that what was done by the angel was real. He thought he was seeing a vision. And when they were past the first and the second guard posts, they came to the iron gate that leads to the city, which opened to them all on its own accord. And they went out and they went down one street and immediately the angel departed from him. And when Peter had come to himself, he said, Now I know for certain that the Lord has sent his angel, and he has delivered me from the hand of Herod and from all the expectation of the Jewish people. So why does the chapter begin with the death of one and the freeing of the other from prison? Frankly, we don't know the answers to any of these questions. And you know, that's okay. God knows, and we can trust him with the things that are mysteries to us. Let's end, though, today by turning to the book of Genesis, chapter number 45. These judges are here in part to remind us that God doesn't tell us everything, and that's okay. Joseph is more of an example of Jesus in the Old Testament than any other character. And yet his life was one that must have left him scratching his own head. Think about Joseph. He had a miraculous birth. He was despised by his own. He was misunderstood by his own. He was hated by his own. He was betrayed by his own. He was sold into the hands of foreigners to Gentiles by his own. He was left for dead by his own. He was accused of crimes 
that he never committed and he was wholly innocent of. And yet we find in his story that God didn't forget him. We don't see God in the story. Go ahead and read it. You don't see God. When Joseph was in prison the first time, God didn't appear and say, hey, let me give you some encouraging words. Joseph just sat in jail when he was down in that pit waiting to be killed after his brothers threw him in there. Do you think an angel appeared and said, hey, cheer up, ye saints of God. There's nothing to worry about, nothing to make you feel afraid and nothing to make you doubt. Remember, Jesus never fails, so why not stand up and shout? You'll be glad that you were here tomorrow morning. <laughs> that didn't happen to Joseph. And yet that's the message we so often hear from a pulpit. And yet there are a lot of secret things that God keeps to himself. In Genesis 45, we're getting to the end of Joseph's story. And Joseph's brothers stand in front of him to plead their case, to plead for their lives. And Joseph reveals his identity to them, just as Jesus will do when he comes back at his second coming to the Jewish people. Follow along with me in Genesis 45, verse number one. Joseph could not restrain himself before all those who stood by him. He cried out, make everyone go out from me. So no one stood with him while Joseph made himself known to his brothers. And he wept aloud and the Egyptians in the house of Pharaoh heard it. And Joseph said to his brothers, I'm Joseph. Does my father still live? But his brothers couldn't answer him because they were dismayed in his presence. And Joseph said to his brothers, please come near to me. And they came near. And he said to them, I am Joseph, your brother, whom you sold into Egypt. But now, do not therefore be grieved or angry with yourselves because you sold me here, because God sent me before you to preserve life. Verse 6, for these two years the famine has been in the land, and there are still five years in which there will be neither plowing nor harvesting. And God sent me before you to preserve a posterity for you in the earth, to save your lives by a great deliverance. Verse eight, so now it was not you who sent me here, it was God, and he has made me a father to Pharaoh and the Lord of all his house and a ruler throughout all the land of Egypt. Verse number nine, so hurry, go up to my father and say to him, thus says your son Joseph, God, has made me Lord of all Egypt, come down to me and do not tarry. All the disappointments and all the sorrows, all those sleepless, wandering nights, all those lonely moments of Joseph's days and nights, and all of those questions that he had for all of those years suddenly became clear to Joseph in a moment of time. God sent me to preserve life. God sent me to preserve life. God sent me to save life. God sent me for a great deliverance. You didn't send me. God sent me. And God has made me the Lord of all of Egypt. Now go to chapter 50. Their father dies and Joseph's brothers are now fearful that with dad gone, Joseph will take revenge. But Joseph's heart had been affected by God a long time before. And notice his response. Let's start with verse 19. Oh, Joseph said to them, do not be afraid. Am I in the place of God? We've talked about that before. God is the judge. God knows. God will take care of it. God will judge. God will bring justice. God will bring vengeance. Verse 20. But as for you, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good. In order to bring it about as it is this day, to save many people alive. Therefore, do not be afraid. I will take care of you. I will provide for you and your little ones. And he comforted them and he spoke kindly to them. The mystery of Joseph's life had been solved. Faith finally became sight. The ways of God are infinite. The ways of God are unsearchable, just like he is. But that's where faith comes into the picture. 
Our place isn't to understand everything that inquiring minds want to know. Our thing is to learn, to trust him in all the things, all the questions, all the unknowns, so that we can obey him, so we can honor him, so we can live for him. It reminds me of something the Apostle Paul wrote. After that great question at the end of chapter 7 of Romans, who will deliver me from this body of death? He goes on to write those wonderful words. We know that all things work together for the good of those who love God and who are the called according to his purpose.